Hello everyone, welcome to Heart's Happiness Podcast. The place where I, Manpreet, share my journey of healing intergenerational family trauma to help you to understand your story. I share a bunch of tools and tips that will transform your mental health and allow you to find your own heart's happiness. So exciting, right? Each episode will cover one of three areas. One, raising awareness of what this trauma actually is and how it hides in our lives. Two, tools, tips, support, lots of different things that I've used to get better and heal from this trauma. And three, I'll be connecting you with so many specialists and therapists and coaches as guests on my show. So we are going to transform your mental health and empower you to take your healing by the hands and move forward. Hello, my loves. Welcome back. We have an episode with a guest this week, Sharice, and she is talking about, or we're both talking about our relationship with our unavailable dads. It was a great conversation. Honestly, I've spoken to her for about 24 hours. <laughs> we had so much to chat about and I really hope it helps you guys because I know a lot of the letters and emails and things I hear from people are those of us that have struggled with low self-worth and, and an unavailable parent. So I think this could be a really powerful episode for you while we share our stories. And if you do relate, and this is something that you do want to work on, my eight-week course is like the foundation of building self-worth. I am relaunching it, and I am calling it Taking Your Power Back, or Take Your Power Back. And the first lesson drops on the 23rd of June, and you can watch it anytime, any country, anywhere. And if you are interested, I will pop the details in the episode notes. So this is an eight-week course of like self-discovery, with homeworks and lessons from me and um, there's also some su- a supportive uh, group where I answer questions etc like that and it's a great starting point especially if you're a bit nervous about actually meeting me or working with me one-to-one and because that's what trauma can do to us as well so check out the calls and also this is something I go deeper with um, in, with my one-to-one clients anyway let's chat to Cherise and explore our unavailable deaths Welcome to the podcast, Cherise. I'm so happy that you're here. Did you want to introduce yourself to everyone and explain what it is that you do? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me here, Manpreet. This is quite exciting, actually. It is. <laughs> it is. Um, so, yeah, I'm Cherise um, and I'm a spiritual counsellor um, and a holistic healer. Um, I mainly work with women um, and... I guess my sort of, not speciality, but the thing that I sort of really like to work with women on is releasing shame and really sort of looking at the root cause, um, sometimes working with the inner child. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested in, in helping uh, women to, to look at the things that they, they usually reject, you know, the, the really ugly stuff, the dark stuff, the negative things that they say that they, you know, that they suppress um, with the view of bringing it all into alignment and, and, and helping them to really empower themselves um, and just hold, holding that space for them to unfold. Um, so the way I do that is by spiritual counseling. Um, I also um, teach conscious parenting um and I'd also do uh, energy healing as well so lovely I love I mean I'm it's very similar to kind of stuff well not in the way that you do it but I'm all about that inner child work and shining that light into those dark corners of our story right mm. because when they sort of are hiding in the we, when we have no awareness they start to unconsciously show up in our lives and cause us problems Absolutely. but when we shine light, light into them um that's when we get our power back. So I love what you do. And that's why I wanted to have you here so much. But also because like many of us that do this work, we all have a story that we have unpacked ourselves. And this month on the podcast, we're exploring our relationships with our dads. Mm -hmm. And and when we chatted before, like it's almost, we had different dads, different relationships with our dads, but maybe we're showing up in our lives in similar ways. So I would love for you to tell us a little bit about your relationship with your dad growing up with him, etc. Do you know what, Manpreet, it's so funny because after our conversation about it, when you know, when you asked me, it felt very timely, you know, um, 
But after our conversation, it sort of left me bubbling inside. And I was like, oh, what's going on here? I've got some oh. thoughts and feelings that really arose after that. Um, and one of the ways that I sort of process my, my feelings is by journaling and, and writing about it. So I did that. And what I realized is that, um, you know, throughout my life, I've had um, therapy and things to support my healing. And the relationship with my dad never really was front and center. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I looked very deeply at my mother wounds and the inner child and all of that. And, and at times it would pop pop in, but I never really focused on him. Um, and actually, I, I, I'm, I'm coming to realize that I haven't really fully needed to, but it did bring up a few memories from childhood. And there was also some grief. I, I, you know, I did actually feel quite overwhelmed I was like wow where the hell did this come from oh my gosh <laughs> sorry um, so it do you know what it was amazing and it was needed and like I said it's so timely I always think these things are are almost divinely inspired you know um and in terms of where I am in my life it's definitely a, a it definitely highlighted parts that were hindering me you know so I by the time I was born my mum and dad had already separated um there was uh a lot of distance until probably I was about six or seven um and during my journaling process after speaking to you I realized that my earliest memory I think I was about five and I remember trying to call him and the number didn't work and I realized how I internalized that as he was trying to get away from me Mm. um he didn't want to to see me or be with me and yeah it was really like wow that was the first sort of messaging that I had also created you know in reality I don't know if that was completely true but in my mind at that time at five I was like he doesn't want me he doesn't you know um but anyway, so the, the journey has been very much, uh, I love him, I hate him. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be close to him, I don't want to be near him. Um, and that was because there was a lot of abandonment and inconsistency. Um, he was emotionally unavailable um, and emotionally abusive. And I say that in terms of, in terms of him being quite narcissistic like you know gaslighting um and whenever he would you know promise to come and see me there would he wouldn't turn up and if I was upset about that he wouldn't speak to me so it was you know over time I learned that being being angry in fact anger being being one of the main ones wasn't really um acceptable Mm. and if I'd expressed that then he would leave so I learned to suppress those feelings, to not to not be comfortable with my big emotions, mm. because it would mean that I would be abandoned and I would be rejected. Mm. Um, so it meant that my, my boundaries weakened. I had really low self-worth. Um, and also distrust in men. I didn't mm. I know in terms of my relationships, it really impacted that. Um, and I guess I got to the point where I decided I'd... I, I, I I no longer want to accept this. Um, So I had to draw a line and say enough is enough um, and and create some distance so that I could focus on me and what I needed. Um, But yeah, it's it's been so, I mean, there's just been so many things. I don't know, really. (laughs) How much detail would you like? So I guess, so there's been a dance that you and your dad have done basically your whole life where you've shuffled towards him yeah sometimes he may be there sometimes he may not be there and um and and if if you ever have an emotion about that he can't handle that so it's projected back to you Mm -hmm. absolutely which is so painful and what's crazy is I live with my dad for you know he died when I was 26 Mm -hmm. but I can relate so much to that 
that story that he was emotionally unavailable, but I live with him mm-hmm. or that I wanted so much to connect and be close with him, um, but that he couldn't give that to me. And he also had some narcissistic tendencies. He was so distracted by his own trauma. I didn't oh, yeah. see that as at the time, yeah. but I just saw that as a real lack of love. And, and like yourself, feeling like relationships with men or men in general just were very unsafe yeah. and like my dad I I was attracted to men like him that I kept wanting to fix all the time um, I don't know if you had that pattern but um yeah, yeah and I and, and again when we were talking earlier like when I was unaware of all of this um I it was all in the dark shadows and that when I died my life actually got easier without him but really, um, that pain, that inner child pain I had was this little girl, a bit like the little girl in you that called him, that still just really wanted him to love her. Like, that is something that stayed with me, you know, long yeah. after his passing. Yeah. And that's like how much, how much do we adore our parents, no mm, matter yeah. what they do to us, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and there is a grief with that. So no wonder after our conversation, some of that's popping into your head, yeah. even. That yeah, love. yeah. Yeah, and and it just yeah it got me to connect with with the little me that um, has still been sort of subtly reaching out in other ways. At the moment, we my dad and I have no contact because I decided that was best for me. Um, however, uh, you know I, I have two children who who also have dads who are somewhat unavailable. <laughs> so in you know there are times where it. it it brings up stuff for me, you know, and and there is uh, an awareness that there is a pattern that has been recreated here. Um, but that connection to the inner child has just been pivotal in, in healing and repairing for me. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, just just you know, giving her that space to to grieve because it's it's painful. It is it's such so grief. Yeah, it's such grief, and it's like letting that part of us. Um, tell us how they felt right because we like you said I wasn't allowed to say how I feel like sometimes be like dad you shouldn't be speaking to me like that you should swear at me or whatever Mm -hmm. and he'd he'd either shame or blame me or my mum would tell me that I shouldn't be talking to him like that because he's a man and that just you know and so that part of me was very silent and very quiet I don't know if you experience this with even with your clients that it's so hard sometimes to connect to your inner child because they have been silenced for so long. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, my inner child was was so suppressed that that um, she didn't trust me. <laughs> yes, <laughs> she didn't you know she didn't trust me to lead because you know through my dad's abandonment and rejection, I'd also learned to abandon and reject myself. Yeah. Um, and over time, um, you know, in, in 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 within my relationships that I'd created with men, my unstable relationships, it was like showing her that I wasn't trustworthy either. Mm. So it took a lot, a lot to go there. It took mm. a lot to to connect with her um, because there was resistance. There was resistance mm. for me because of that that pain was so intense. The emotions Mm. were so big and I didn't know how to be with them because I hadn't allowed myself to, Mm. you know. They do feel like they're going to kill you, don't they? They feel like death, absolutely. Like, oh my God, if I go there, I'm going to die or I'm going to lose my mind and I'm going to be questioning because it just feels that deep and intense. Yeah, it's so true. And that's why you have to be in the right space. Having that space for him, from him, helps you to do it because if he's he's doing his behaviours, it kind of re-traumatises you every single time. But sometimes having space from your parent to be able to do the healing is so it's like just what you need what your body needs even yeah yeah so, and when you're caught in the sort of in the patterns and the cycles you don't necessarily notice what's happening you know and um the the, the game playing it can feel very much like you know like you said it's the dance isn't it I was just thinking you know the time it's totally a dance <laughs> Totally. <laughs> we're just always chasing after him like, yeah dad if I, mean, I do this will I be good for you if I do this will I be good mm-hmm. for you and like you know I was saying before you know the journey sort of loving him and then hating him and you know it was very much convincing myself that um 
it was me. <laughs> you know, maybe if I do this, if I bend myself out of shape a little bit more, he will give me the connection that I, I need. Um, and later on, you know, sort of looking at some of the wounding, I went into, okay, I forgive him. I understand what he's, what, where he's at and I let it go and I'll just accept him for what he is. But actually what that did was still suppress the needs that I had for him. Mm. Um, and it didn't uh, allow me to see that I actually was then starting to please him. I wanted to please him. I wanted to be the good little girl. Mm. And it wasn't really about forgiving him. It wasn't really about accepting him. It was another way that I was trying to reach out to connect with him. Sure. Um, and actually that just hurt me more. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. No, that's the thing. Because to to say to him, I've got these boundaries, this is what I need. If he's still going to react in the same way, then he's just not ready for to love you in the way that you need yet. But not to say that he, I mean, life's a long time, that, that he may not change. Mm. But that's what it is. Unless you tell them how they can love you, what they need to do. And we didn't, we tried that when we were children, but as adults, it's a whole other thing. But we could still do that. But you know, they have a choice to do it or not. And yeah. we don't have to be in the relationship if it hurts us and continues to um, re-traumatise us, right? Mm. Because that is so painful because that will just keep repeating that p- pattern of, um, like, neglect and hurt and, yeah. um, you know, abandonment, betrayal, all mm. of those feelings, they come up, don't they? And I mean, I, like, I always laugh about this. I did a degree my dad wanted me to do. I went to the university he wanted me to do. I went, I got a job that he wanted me to do. I did all of the things he wanted me to do because I so wanted him to say, you're good enough, I love you, mm. um, you know. But whatever I did for him, he always wanted me to do something else. He always wanted me to do more yeah. because, like, for I, the, what I feel for him was he was trying to fill something up on the inside for himself mm. through my achievement or something, mm. which um, which he never was because it wasn't his what I realise now that was his wound but at the time I really exhausted myself trying I don't know if you would like like you said fold yourself up however they may want yeah get that love back yeah Uh, you know one of the painful things that I that surfaced for me was so uh, you know as a child my dad was was sort of a womanizer you know he was very much into women young women and he made no secret about looking at them when I was with him um yeah and he, you know he was a, a serial cheater um and he would you know be very manipulative and use me to hold his secrets you know he would uh call me and say oh if my wife phones you tell her that I was with you and I'd be like I haven't seen you for months you know what do you mean tell her what you know and I kind of initially would 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 do it as he asks you know he would say oh your sister um something about my, my siblings and oh, don't tell your siblings this. And initially I would hold them because it was like, that's what my dad's asking me to do. This is going to get me the connection. And then I started to see, actually, no, you, what, you're not connecting with me. You don't really want to be with me. Instead, you just want to use me. Um, but anyway, so watching him behave in this way, cheat on his wife, watching other women, I realized that I learned that I needed to be desirable to be worthy of connection. Mm -hmm. And how that translated in my relationships would be, I would attract men who are similar traits, emotionally unavailable, narcissistic potentially, um, but who, as long as they desired me or showed me that desire, then it would mean I I would, would have their love and connection regardless of all the other things that was so wrong with the relationship. So it was almost like a, I would say it was like sexualization in a way, or, and that was like, oh my God, you know, desire, <laughs> the desire to be loved by him meant that I allowed so many things in my, in my male relationships. Like I, it just felt so huge for me to, to uncover that because I hadn't seen that before mm, in, so in, in how he was with other women. So you're looking at young girls, some of them around my age, <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, so I need to be like that in order to get my dad's attention. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Quite. That's, quite. That's, 
That's a big one, isn't it? And yeah. and then for, and then to carry that through into your romantic relationships, that I must be attractive, I must look a certain way, I must dress yeah. a certain way, and all of these things are further betrayal of yourself because Absolutely. it's losing the authentic version of who who you actually are, yeah. and and becoming who you think you need to be to yeah. be loved. Yeah. Um, like I was. I used to spend so long getting ready. I haven't got the energy for that anymore. Like yeah. I could not be asked, or I was always like wearing like a great outfit because I wanted so much that attention from men in terms mm-hmm. of how I looked mm-hmm. because that's what I believed was the only thing that I had that was worth of anything. Well, not that I felt like I was massively attractive, but yeah. that's what I was told got me attention, yeah. and it did. Yeah, um, not not the right kind often, but yeah. But I was happy with any kind of attention. Mm, That's mm, anything. I had such a low bar when it came to, um, you know, getting my those needs met because I was comparing them to my dad. Yeah. So yeah. it wasn't much. And and like yourself, the more unavailable they were, the more I chased them. Yeah. 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 And then you went was. through the dance, right? It's 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 yeah. yeah. Chase and after them. They chase after you. You reject them. They reject you. It, it, it's just the cycle. Yeah, and then you sort of overthink everything, and you and then you try and again you further lose yourself to please the relationship that you're in. That's how I think that the father wound is just so important, especially when you're you know if you're a straight woman or if you're a gay man and you're and you're trying to have a relationship with that sex, it kind of plays out. Yeah, and um, that's what I found. And my dad wasn't even alive anymore, but mm-hmm. it was playing out more and more and more and more. It was like the wound was just getting worse as I got older. Mm-hmm. It became more apparent. Mm-hmm. And I just, at one point, I just looked at myself and I was like, "Oh my god, what what am I doing?" I'm yeah. so. And I tried really. I was very aware that he that he wasn't quite right. So the men often didn't look like him physically. No. They looked very different to him. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, had maybe they weren't as shouty as him and stuff like that but the the themes there were similar you know very needy it was all about what they needed they generally needed saving from something Um, and that pattern kind of was just prominent through everything and then I would be upset with them for you know not being fixed but you know yeah I went for them yeah you know, I could have gone for someone that was a completely different type of man yeah I don't know if you experienced that with like your relationships and with your that your father's both the kids dads or anything yeah. like that but it's it carries on basically without that awareness it does I mean uh, the pattern for me was men who had dysfunctional relationships with their mothers and I took on the role of caretaker and mm. being the mother um mm. I think I did that too and and <laughs> You know, because it, it's also, I think, in terms of, you know, the, the the sort of society and cultural, you know, in your relationship, the woman takes care of the man and the woman does this and, the woman, you know, it's like becoming the nurturer. But more than that, I guess, because I had, you know, and both of my parents were, were, were ab- abandoned me in, in one way or another. So I kind of, I feel like I got, I over overdid the caretaking and people pleasing. Um, but very much, yeah, men that needed looking after um, and needed fixing. And I mm. and I thought I could fix them. And I always held on to the hope that they would change. Mm. You know, if I do this, then they will do that. If I do this, then ag- again, bending, bending myself um, with my with my children's um, dads. Um, so my son's my son, he's 12 and. I met his dad, a similar sort of story in terms of needing to be desired. And that was the hook, you know, once I knew he was interested in me, I, I liked him, <laughs> but there was more, it was more about how was I to him, you know? Um, but very, very early on, I realized, oh my God, this is a, a repeat, but I didn't realize the depth of it until my son was growing and seeing his behavior and similar to my daughter really again it was like you know with that relationship it was very much about how can I hang on to this person because if they leave me I'm going to be left with nothing he if they leave me they're going to abandon me and even to the point of how, yeah, can I can I then have a baby with this person? Because then that maybe they will stay. Maybe then I'll be lovable enough 
um, and they won't leave, even though I knew the relationship wasn't great and I wasn't really happy. And actually at that point, I'd lost myself. I was, mm. I didn't know who I was anymore. Mm. I just knew that I didn't, I, I couldn't be alone. I couldn't be abandoned by this person because it was translating to abandonment. Mm. You no, know, I, I, I didn't have the courage to leave. Um, and it, and it, and it was like, I needed to stay at all costs. Yeah. All costs. And, I, and, it, and it cost me me. It cost me my mental health. Yeah. Cause you can get so obsessed with it and trying to do you can put so much energy in trying to save this man and that you lose absolutely like because I'm similar to you in the sense of the caretaking and the people pleasing Mm. that mine went really out of control that you know I I could I would know what they wanted to eat where they wanted to go and I did have no idea about my own wants and needs or anything and underneath all that, it was like, okay, they're a good person. They're, they're, they're really a good person. So that was my excuse also, you know, oh, I can see the good in them. They, they mean well. So, you know, and, and, and which is what I kept doing with my dad. Oh, he's a good person, you know. And actually, I remember his wife saying to me, you know, he's a good person. I know he does this, but he's a good person. And I started to realise, especially sort of in my, in my early 20s, that I then replaced all my negative memories with positive ones all of the reasons why I should love him all the reasons why he is a good person and it it then turned into more of a fantasy rather Mm. than fully memories of the good times yeah which is a coping strategy it was absolutely it was Mm. it was it was it was and I think that's the power of the subconscious, right? All of these ways that we kind of create illusions to, to keep us safe, you know? Um, I, I really believed that the negative things didn't matter. Mm. It's fine. And one day my, my, um, my stepdad said to me, oh, you know, how come you don't see your dad much? What's, what's that about? And as I explained to him that the relationship, which he'd never really understood before, he was like, gosh, you know, why do you love him? Mm. And that question was so activating because it, it helped me to realize the fantasy and the illusion that I created, because actually it helped me to identify and name the emotional abuse Mm. because it wasn't physical. It was emotional and it was not, it was, it was often subtle and covert. But actually the impact from that was what made me believe that I'm broken and I'm unworthy. Mm. And, you know, it, it, it's so deeply connected to the self-worth. And as I'm, you know, building my business and I'm, I'm raising my children, I'm, I'm constantly brought back to, you know, deserving. Do I deserve this? Mm. Have I, am, am I okay (laughs) yeah is this going to be all right am I going to be all right do I need to be fully healed to be seen and show up you know yeah (laughs) yes endless question when you're trying to (laughs) yeah Yeah. but the thing is I mean what like we'll get to the good stuff of how we're coming out of this but you know that unworthy feeling was like minus numbers wasn't it at stage and it slowly builds up it just takes time a whole childhood and a whole lifetime of having no worth and then realizing that we do deserve we're worthy of healthier love or we're worthy of like a job we enjoy and all these things yeah. but there is it's a little ladder to get up there it because because some of that old programming is pulls you back into it yep. and um and what, what I think is really interesting about what you said about you know we never had the language we didn't know what was it because I'm very similar he ne- my dad never hit me I was a bit threatened by it but he never hit me but it was all of the words it yes. was those that and they are so wounding like at the end of the day society culture if someone hits you you physically can see it school can see it yeah. you know people notice that and we do know that's wrong but yeah. in terms of this emotional 
abuse that's been happening in so many families yeah. subtly um for you know my mom is like one of the nicest women I know but she was gently gaslighting and emotionally abusing me because she thought that was parenting yes because that's what she's experienced and I think the fact that there's so many more of us talking about that this is abuse and that it does affect us and that if your parent isn't going to ch- rein that in and that as an adult you may have to take a step back from them because yeah. I get I work with a lot of um, Asian clients um, who are like but you know how can I get them to stop well you can tell them what you need you can say it but you can't make them stop they Mm -hmm. have to do the healing work to accept that about them Mm -hmm. and that's a dark place to go right yeah because I mean you know we can all hate on a narcissist but they are just a traumatized child as well projecting their pain and I think um you know as I've got older on my own healing journey getting these words and this language that about gaslighting about emotional abuse it's about things like I'm learning new terms all the time like hoovering and all these (laughs) other things that you realize that oh my god that's happened to me by by my whole life yeah actually that's not love that's actually trauma and that even sometimes your body even as a child knew it wasn't right because you can feel it right but then your adult parents told you no Mm -hmm. this is Mm -hmm. this is fine Mm -hmm. so you that's how the distrust for yourself begins because your own body has been telling you that and I still have that now when I put boundaries in with family members and they're like well I didn't do anything wrong it's like no well I feel like that's wrong for me so yeah and, and I think just even doing that, that's a complete awakening in itself, discovering these things about your childhood and that actually that was wrong and it's not OK to treat someone mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and again, shining light in those corners is just yeah. powerful, isn't it? It is. And I think that, you know, like you said, to listening to your body, our, our bodies are so amazing. They really <laughs> you know, are. They're super intelligent and they are communicating with us all the time and I think, like you said, as children, we knew there was something in us that didn't feel right. We felt hurt by these things. There's a reason why the, the words and, and the behavior impacted us. But we, yeah, we didn't have the language. And the journey for me has been really tuning into my body. What is my body telling me? And learning to, to, to honor that because I've spent so long out of it. I've sp- spent so long disconnected from myself. Mm-hmm. Um, that I, I, I've, yeah, I've overlooked what it's been saying, the unsafety, mm. there's been a lack of safety for a long time. Yeah, um, yeah so true. You know, and, yeah. and we learned to escape our body because it felt, it always felt so unsafe in it. Yeah. The way I would freeze and numb and just escape it Maybe. into a fantasy, into whatever, if I was taking a substance or something, yeah. because yeah. The, the, the pain in the body just got stronger, really. Yeah. It didn't yeah. go. And, then, and again, it was like death. <laughs> like yes. I, I can't, you know, I'm going to explode if I, if I, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I yeah. won't survive this. No, no. And that's, you know, that's our innate sort of desire, I think, as children is to survive. And we adapt and we bend and we, we, we mould ourselves so that we can protect ourselves. And actually, in doing that, we are disconnecting. Mm. Definitely. And so many of us as well. I think it's something that affects like whether it was a huge abuse at home or subtle, it affects us in in different ways, especially in those development Mm -hmm. years. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, I always show I don't know if you've seen the video of the stair face experiment where um, the doctor it's a mom, mother and daughter, like a baby, and the mum's really close and lovely with the daughter. But the minute she turns off her emotions, um, the baby reacts and gets really distressed and upset. Mm-hmm. And I always go to my clients, how many times did you have a stare face parent? Because in my house, that was all of the time. Yeah. <laughs> you wow. know, I didn't, and that you, the amount that you need to connect with your parent and to feel safe with them, that when you don't have that, and that, and, you know, I really think that, for me, I needed that from both of them. It was, mm-hmm. I needed both of that energy from them mm-hmm. and I didn't, didn't get it. And I know that it's a lot from your mum, obviously, but I'm starting to realise how much actually I needed from dad too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, I, I, yeah, I was thinking about the, the, the boundaries and the protection and the, you know, I needed a protector. I needed an advocator. I needed somebody mm-hmm. to, to advocate for me. You know, um, I remember a time that 
um, my dad introduced me to one of his friends. He came up, I used to work in a pharmacy years and years ago. I think I was about 19, 18. And he came in with his friend and he introduced me to his friend. And later that day, I got a phone call from his friend. And he's, this is a much older man. And my dad was trying to hook me up with him. <gasps> and I was horrified oh because I God. thought, why, why, where in the world is that okay? You're supposed to be protecting me, not not pimping me, you know, pimping That's... me out to your friends. And it just it just made me think, wow, you know, and 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 not just that. In in times in my life where I felt unsafe, it's that masculine energy that I've wanted to yeah. do and to protect me. And actually, what happens is I I embodied more of that masculine and became quite hard and rigid in myself as a way to protect myself, mm. you know, and, and started to shut down my emotions and, and, um, and, and didn't speak up for myself, mm. you know, and, and it's like, then the question becomes, you know, how do you become the father for you? How do you, yes. how do you become the father you never had? And um, yeah, I really, I, I reflected on that actually as after our last conversation, you know, what, what made me think, what else do I feel like I still need? um in order for me to to feel okay in me mm. and I think it's it's ongoing and I think a lot of this work is um done in relationship yes you know, there's there's a lot that we can do on our own and, and in therapy and all the ways all the tools and resources but until we we get into relationship and and things start to to be live in the here and now it can be very, very difficult to, to work through it in an, at any other time. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was somebody that either avoided relationships completely or like chased after unavailable people that we were never together, but I was always alone. Yeah. But the thing is, when I was avoiding them completely, I, this was not, this was simmering under the surface. And it was only when I started to date, like actively in my mm -hmm. 30s, that I started to realise that something was seriously not right. Yeah. And I was completely unaware of it when I was avoiding, basically. Yeah. And that's that's the thing. And then that made me a bit terrified because I was like, gosh, your taste of it is pretty shocking. But then as I worked on it and I knew I had to get back out there again to see if it's changed. Mm. And, um, um, and it did. And that's how then I had met my now husband um but I was uh, but the first thing with him I was crazy because I was questioning with everything or you know trying oh, to find God. you know so hyper vigilant <clears throat> oh my goodness yeah, yeah like oh my god I think he's like really tight like my dad was or you know just making yeah. shit just making shit up really. yeah <laughs> not any of those things um I don't know I must have driven him mad but to be and then to be learn how to be vulnerable and speak my truth to <sighs> him when all my life I had been the good girl with men and just whatever they wanted, like, you know, in every, in, in sex, in everything, you know, it yes. was like a real, and to be, and then that was, but that's very healing when you can then be like, actually you, you kind of upset me when you did that. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. when you're with a healthier man, he's just mm -hmm. like, Oh, I'm sorry that I upset you. I will definitely work on that. Or yeah. that's not something that I'm going to get be able to give you. Yeah. And what I discovered through, you know the fantasies I had about being with a man and being in a relationship was so different because really it's still all about me and taking care of myself yeah taking yeah. care of my own needs but he's just something extra I think it's been a real um journey in itself because and I have a lot of clients that struggle with relationships and that whole dance or avoiding and you know there is a time to withdraw and to heal oh, yeah. on your own and then there is a time to go again and, mm. and become very aware. And that's like two very painful, triggering things, but they help us with our wounding. And something like just you might want to do this with your inner child. When I first moved in together with Simon a couple of years ago, I was acting crazy. like I was just not being very nice to him. And, and so I sat with my inner child and literally very strongly she said to me, well, I'm sorry, like, um, but she does not trust men full stop and how do we know that we can trust him and how do I know I can trust your judgment because mm -hmm. you've not protected me before with the yeah. other men 
Yeah. And, um, you know, and I did a whole exercise in my head, which may sound crazy to anyone listening, but I brought my inner child to come live with us. And I was like, mm-hmm. if you feel unsafe with him, you tell me and I'll talk to him about it. Um, but I think this is a safe place. And then those feelings I was having just went away Amazing. just from that exercise. And that's yeah. how powerful that work actually mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Definitely. I've, I've definitely done quite a few um journeys with my inner child to, to integrate her you know and and, and yeah. at times she's been at different ages and stages and yes and sometimes like my inner teen is protecting you know the young, younger one or it, there's so many different dynamics but that bridging that connection is is pivotal um I just wanted to go back to what you're saying about dating because you just reminded me I mean I, I'm not dating at the moment but having dated and and I'm just I'm laughing in my mind at the, the, the craziness <laughs> you know god I it still makes me triggered it's so it's just oh my goodness you know when I look back I'm I'm laughing because I I can you know I can see the humor in it now it doesn't feel so um doesn't feel shameful it's it's where I was you know and I couldn't really be anywhere else but um I remember I was dating this this guy and he was really lovely, but I had made up a story about who he was in my mind. Oh God, I've done that. And yeah. I was really angry. I was really um, uh, defensive. <laughs> and he yes. was like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, what's wrong? What's wrong with you? You know, it's not, oh, you're, you know, I just made up a whole story. And it wasn't until I sort of came away. I, I couldn't understand why there was so much friction. And, you know, there was just like this conflict and we just couldn't quite, and I was like, and it was me. It was me yes. really blocking this person who was in their power, who knew themselves. I was like, you don't know, you know, but you're hiding this and trying to read between the lines. And like you said, that hypervigilance, you know. Um, and again, it, it wasn't until I sort of stepped away or that it sort of it didn't work. But it was just like, oh, I felt I did feel sick. Actually, I felt like, oh, oh God, that was me. I shame. thought that up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He was actually yeah. a really nice man and I didn't think and sometimes it's because we didn't think we were worthy of that. And that or, is exactly it. You yeah. know, yeah. So there must be something person. wrong because you don't <laughs> want me otherwise. Oh, I without a doubt have done yeah. the same. I have ended relationships where, you know, and I nearly did that with my now husband, mm. where I talked myself out of it. Oh my god. Oh, do we have chemistry though? Because yeah. you know, I'm not being triggered every two seconds. Yeah. So yeah. I sleep really well with him. So there must yeah. be something because you know. that's that that's that I mean what does it mean to be safe what does it feel like if it's been your normal for so long I mean yeah you know being in my body being grounded being connected to myself has not been familiar for me oh no it's actually felt so safe that it's felt unsafe yes you know? and it, it yeah discomfort has been more comfortable and our okay. brains want to take us back as well to absolutely. what's familiar. Absolutely. So triggered response. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. I found that this a lot. So unknown. Um, and, then, and I think the moment I realized something had shifted was was dating again after some time. And the, the, the type of men that, that were coming into my life were like, okay, they have availability, they have substance, they have, but it was actually mirroring my progress in me. Yes. You know, the, the ability to to show up as myself, to be a bit vulnerable, to to open, to be open, um, and and to see people as they were, because I was seeing myself as I was. Mm. You know, I wasn't judging where I am, and I and I, you know, the belief of being so broken that I can't, I have to heal before I can date again was was wasn't wasn't so strong you know no it's true because you do when you're within it and like you said and I'm a great believer that whoever you're attracting in is based on whatever's going on within you for sure and the more that you become feeling worthy loving yourself taking care of yourself you will attract a person that is similar energy to that right absolutely absolutely and for um like your you know on your journey of healing and with your children so now that you've got all these tips of how to do (laughs) how do you help them navigate um you know their unavailable dads at a a much younger age in life Mm. so my my I guess my thing is really supporting them with expressing their needs and connecting to what they need um and and using their voice um 
I we we have family meetings weekly. We just we just touch base with each other. Oh, that's so nice. Um, and I really try to help them with the language um, to figure out what they're feeling and if they're upset, if they felt they're not being heard. Um, yeah, because I recognize that, you know. Well, I say I recognize. My belief is that our children choose us, right? And that I chose yeah. my parents and you know the journey is is for them also and as much as I'm their mother I'm not responsible for everything mm. um and it's I, their I'm journey not, it is yeah. their journey and that that's taken a lot for me to detangle because I think there's this you know inherent guilt that mothers I think talk about which happens as soon as they're born that you're not giving them all that they need and I really initially tried to provide everything and be everything and compensate for the lack of the father not being there by burning out and doing too much and and like I said taking responsibility for even the parts that weren't mine um however let, letting that go meant that I could be there to listen to them when they're upset and hold the space for them when they're not getting their needs met but then mm-hmm. support them with with identifying what they need and 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 how to do it in the best way you know and I always encourage them if that's how you feel and how he's made you feel then speak about it and if you can't speak about it then maybe write about it you know I I I had some times when I was younger I I really found it difficult to to speak to my mom or and I'd I'd write a letter and leave it on my pillow (laughs) because I couldn't say it you know it's very hard to to speak about it um yeah so it, it it yeah I think the the communication and and, and talking feels important mm. um but also just giving giving space um, what I love about that is you're validating them which mm-hmm. we never received right that validation mm-hmm. for a child is so powerful anyway that increases worth as well to that their truth is valid no matter what, you know what it is and also that you're sharing your tools that you mm. use to to process your dad, like your writing or, um, you know, or what, whatever it is like. Sometimes yeah. I go scream in a field. That's, what, yeah. I, that's yeah. what I'll share to a client. Or, you know, the anger I find very hard to process because I was told it was so wrong. Mm-hmm. But that's the thing. When you go on your own journey of healing, that you are able to help your children, even if they are, if even if it is later in life. Um, I know I have clients that when they do my courses, it makes them very aware of not only their own childhood but their kids childhood and then that guilt and that shame and everything can kind of come to the surface but like you said I really believe as well that you know we were meant to be their children and meant to have this experience because it was meant to be our journey Mm -hmm. and 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 especially when we heal and come through it because then there's a there's a piece that comes from that and, and there's all these learning and then like the thing, the work that we do is because of the experiences we've had, right? And that we're mm-hmm. able to help people in that way. Mm-hmm. And for our kids, that that's their journey too, I guess. Yeah. And um, that's how I always try to get them to, obviously guilt and shame, you've got to process it, but that, you know, you don't know what you don't know when you, otherwise they wouldn't be here, would they? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, and it is that it's, it's, you don't know what you don't know. And it's mm-hmm. like, forgive yourself <laughs> you don't know forgive yourself you know and and like you said the pros the, the shame and the guilt it's it's just everywhere and I and I had to in order for me to to show up for them I had to process that there was just no way I was going to be able to give them what I wanted to or hold the space for them as I wanted to if I hadn't processed the fact that I felt terrible that I'd chosen these men <laughs> I felt terrible that my patterns had impacted and hindered them but in actuality, it was also what they chose for whatever their path is going to be, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I can only be accountable for my part um, and do my best. Um, and I love that you said screaming in the field because I, I think I love that. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. Punching. I, I've got a boxing. My husband got me a boxing bag, and I just go up to that sometimes. I love and that. And scream because again, your body you want to shake you it out. Move. Yes. Yeah. You and and you know, and and having that um, disconnect from my own anger. You know, my son got that that side of me in his early childhood where I suppressed my anger, so he also learned to internalize it. Mm. So as he got older, it became 
difficult for him to manage and he, he would have outbursts and I wouldn't know what the hell to do with that. Because it would be know, triggering as because well. Because it was and I didn't realise it was. I didn't realise it was and, and, and I, initially I shut it down. Initially I was I was like, go go away with that. I don't want to see it. Yeah. You know, what are you angry for? What, why? Um, and and now, yeah, we've got screaming in the pillow, not quite the field, but we're, <laughs> we're doing that. <laughs> come to the come to the sticks to do that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just so I find stuff like that really. Hard. I mean, I do like tapping and things, but mm. sometimes just screaming. It's just it's uh-huh. really helpful, yeah. and just shouting and even swearing or whatever you need to do yes. to be like look at a picture of your parent. And you know, it's only very recently that I've put a photo of my dad in my house. And that's like, he's been gone a number of years because I feel like through my journey and where I'm at now that um, I've really begun to understand him and remember moments where he did show me love and also show me and kind of in his own way, tell me that it wasn't me. And that's what I choose to sort of carry with me. Mm. And that's been very healing for me, especially as I go on to my next journey, which is to try to have a family um you know that there was a lot of grief that I was holding mm. for him because I was just pissed off with him yeah. <laughs> basically yeah. so you've been a shit my whole life and then you killed yourself so I'm really pissed off with you yeah. you know it was a thing to carry for a while yeah. but you know I'm so I'm so glad that um you know I'm that I'm processing it and that I know you know and that I'm able to consciously think about choices for my family and and my life and that's you know as I know this is hard and it's crying and it's pain and it feels like you're going to die sometimes but it's so beautiful when you come from the other side and you see your growth like oh my god I'm attracting a different type of man yeah that's pretty amazing you know or you know or I, you know, I validate my own feelings. Oh, my worth's just grown a little bit. You know, yeah. it's just to see yeah. that in yourself is, you know, as children, we felt so powerless and like we had no choice and this was mm-hmm. our future. But it's so amazing to know that actually, no, it isn't. We get to create whatever we want, no yeah. matter what our story is. And, and that's why I create this podcast for the people that think they are this broken bird Mm-hmm. That's never going to be able to have a good life because of the way they started. And mm-hmm. even society and culture can kind of give us that, you know, if we've come from a broken home or yeah. we've got a parent with mental health problems. But I don't, that's not, I don't believe that. I believe mm-hmm. you can change. And I, I'm sure you do because that's Absolutely. the work you do as well. Absolutely. And I, and I, and I believe that we, we, you know, we heal ourselves. And mm-hmm. I think that feels so far fetched when you're deep in it. You know, yes. because the journey is about looking for someone to help fix us, fix us. And it's about seeking the external validation and all of that. But when we sort of start doing the inner work and, and actually we start cultivating that resilience in us, we, cult- we cultivate that trust and we do it by ourselves you know for ourselves yes yeah and just connecting to your own intuition oh, that yeah. guidance that was always there but you always. were told to not listen to it so you lost it yeah absolutely absolutely I, I love that you said um about putting the picture up in the house because that came up recently because I haven't got one up either oh, um, yeah. and my mom actually said something something along the lines of if 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 he passed, you would have a picture up. So how come he's, you don't have one up, he's alive. And I thought that was really interesting because I hadn't thought about it. I, I just never had a picture up of him. Mm-hmm. So I love that you brought that in because I feel like that's something that I want to think about. <laughs> so what I did before was I've got a picture of him as a little boy in this room in my office next mm-hmm. to my inner child. Mm-hmm. So that helped me to like really begin to Brilliant. build empathy for him. Um, I should really bring my mum in here as well. And, then, and I've got a picture of him holding me as a baby and he looks very happy with me, but never like the part of him when he died, when he was older and he mm-hmm. driven me mad and um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, that version of him, I found very hard to look in the eye, but because mm-hmm. we pr- got it printed for the wedding and I put it in my hallway. So it's big and I literally go and kiss it or oh, I go and talk to him or like, and I've remembered some of, you know, there wasn't many, there was, but there was a handful, you know, like a really small handful, but I'll take it. So, you know, that, and that kind of soothed me and that, 
and I did a meditation not that long ago and I never used to dream about him I never used to see him but he came into it and he like held my hand and he was like that was never your fault Mm -hmm. and you know I'm gonna get emotional but that you know like you were always enough and I and I loved you and that was because I was in pain and just that and just it really just made something click for me, but it took me a very long time. And he's been gone 14 years. It's taken a time, but that was really important for where I'm at in my journey. And we're all at different stages, right? And it's not a rush. Like you don't have to forgive them. You don't have to talk to them. You don't have to have their photo in there. You don't have to do that. Like mm-hmm. I couldn't do that years ago, but that's just kind of where I'm at now. And, yeah. you know, and it changes. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, my other half, he's been estranged from his dad for years and years and years. And um, with the wedding, we invited him and they've reconnected. And like, I was a bit like, God, your dad is so much nicer than my dad. So I don't really understand it. But that's his own journey. And that even after 15, however many years it's been, that you can go back and have a different relationship or you can decide not to. But listening to yourself, what you need, your boundaries and honouring yourself is what it's all about. And that, you know, and all of these things can help, help heal, which is all empowering I think mm, mm. And, and you know it's, it's ongoing and it can change it's, yeah it's like you can change your mind and that's okay I'm sure if we had this conversation in a year it'd yeah. be different it would be I think so <laughs> yeah we'll just have to I see might have some more more exciting dating stories <laughs> oh my god great because I got so many good ones about that like I was a hot mess for such a long time <laughs> But also just pushing away the good ones. I did that a lot. Yeah, too. all that. Yeah, that was, that was a very. And then when you admit that to yourself, you're like, well, this is why you're alone because yeah. you push away the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> but it has been so long. I could literally chat to you all day Aww. because um, I love um, the way that your perspective and the way that you look at everything. Um, so how can anybody that's listening, if they wanted to work with you, how do you help people? How can they find you? And I'll pop everything in the episode notes as well. Oh, thank you. You know, it's been lovely. And every time we talk, it's it's, it's just it just goes, then we could we could touch on we And I like to say to everyone, we've only met each other once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love Zoom for like half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> It's like more than that. It does. Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, my practice is um soul deep wellness. Um, and people can find me on my website, souldeepwellness.com. Um yeah, you can make contact with me there. Again, I do um, energy work, um, spiritual counselling, um, and conscious parenting. They're sort of my, my main sort of areas of, of expertise. Um, and yeah. Fabulous. I'll put that. Is there, is there anything you want to add before we finish? Um, yes, I do. I want to say that um, it's all always always about you and to honor that Mm -hmm. honor that you know um yeah I think I think the self-love journey is difficult healing yourself is difficult but ultimately tuning into yourself will be the thing that liberates us you know um so yeah I just want to send love to everybody who's who's processing their father wounds and you know whether their father's here or not it's yeah love we deserve more love not less exactly and that you can be your father as well you can give yourself what you needed it's like it feels weird because as a woman you're like but how do I be dad but you know like similar to you I was like oh I I really wanted someone I was safe with that I was grounded by that was protective and that was security so how can I give that to myself and how do I know which men don't feel like that that was a real turning point for me just understanding what felt unsafe and really honoring that as well because that's just it's a really important part of the process and it must I know it's hard when you're you've married those people (laughs) all those kind of things but it's again it's all part of the journey Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's what we're here for yeah and it's imperfect but that's us humans really (laughs) for sure thank you man thank you so much this has been lovely thank you so much and there we have it guys an episode completed. I hope you enjoyed it and it raised a load of awareness in your mind. There was alarm bells going. You were all like, ding, that's totally me. Cause that's what I was like when I started this journey. And that is the start of the process, finding out this information and realizing it has happened in your own life. So I really hope it was helpful. 
And before the next episode coming out next Wednesday, be sure to check us out on Instagram. So it's hearts underscore underscore happiness. Also, we have a YouTube channel where I share the videos I create for Instagram on. So you can check that out. They come on about once a week. And then we also have a Facebook group if you want to join to carry on the conversation. I want to create a community where we're all talking about our very real experiences and traumas. And then there is also my website called heartshappiness.co.uk, which you can check out to join our mailing list so that as I create new services and support tools for you all, you're the first to find out. And I have a freebie on there, so definitely check that out. It's five books that transformed my healing. So if you really want to kickstart and you know you're liking the content in here, these books are like the basis of so much of my knowledge. So definitely check that out. And I will speak to you next week. I'm so excited to continue this journey with you to help you to find your own heart's happiness. Take care.